So now I'll start covering, uh, we've covered the arithmetic instruction so far, uh, and uh, some of the inline barrel shifter uh, feature, and things like that. So this, uh, we'll start talking about how we can move data around. Uh, this doesn't cover memory operations yet, but um, there are two instructions that you need to know for moving data from one register to another, and that's MOV and MVN. And what MOV does is, uh, just like it says, it just moves the value in one register into another register. Now there are variations on this. One of them is the move T, uh, which just moves the top half word of the 32-bit value into the destination register. And then there is the uh, move as PC. So this is a special instruction because you're changing the program counter. You're telling it to do a branch at this point. So you're actually taking an instruction address, loading it into PC, and telling it to actually uh, branch to that instruction that's been updated in the PC. Now the other side effect of this is you can see that there's an S flag. And this one is a special instruction because it actually changes the mode as well. So we'll cover a little bit about the different modes. But if you're in user mode, like uh, we've been talking about so far, and uh, you do a move as PCLR, it will uh, switch back to the, uh, it will take the value that was in the SPSR, which was the save program status register of whatever mode you were in, and then update the uh, mode to um, in the CPSR to the current mode. So we'll use this instruction with interrupts especially because whenever an interrupt occurs, uh, like an IRQ or an FIQ exception, the ARM changes mode to, that, uh, to the IRQ or FIQ mode. And it actually takes a copy of the CPSR and puts it into the SPSR for you automatically. Uh, but we, it's our responsibility to take the SPSR and move it back into the CPSR. And so this is sort of a one instruction to do all that um, uh, in one go, essentially. So we'll cover that in more detail later. Uh, finally, we have uh, MVN, which is the move negative. It takes the negative um, one's complement of the value in the register and puts it into the destination register. Um, now, these instructions cannot be used on memory and are only applicable to registers. Um, so, again, getting back to that load store uh, feature of ARM. So, here's some instructions. Um, this was an interesting example because I tried to multiply two constants and it calculated the answer directly for me and uh, generated assembly to do the same. Um, so here you can see it's actually uh, taking this large value, uh, trying to multiply by three, um, but it's actually just loading the uh, value directly into the register. So here in this case, the uh, two million. Um, so this large value down here, get the mouse. So this large value, once you multiply by three, you get another large value, but it's moving um, the entire word with a bogus top half word, and then followed by moving the actual 2797 piece afterwards. So for some reason, it decided to optimize this way. Um, it might not be what you intended for it to do, but that's what it does. So um, it's just uh, good to know. So here it's moving the uh, lower half word value with a bogus upper half word value. And then finally it replaces that upper half word value with uh, 2797 for your final answer. Is there no move lower half only? Uh, there is. So uh, we'll cover that a little bit later. So there's actually you can do it up to the byte. So you can do byte uh, moves. You can do uh, half word moves. Or you can do the 32 bit. Here's another one, but this time we have, uh, we're trying to subtract a really large value from a variable. And so it again, the way it uh, optimizes for these constants is it loads these by using move w, move top, right? And loads the 
loads them half word at a time, and then does the operation. The other interesting thing I wanted to show you is I was able to get the CPSR value to actually update on this one uh, with the uh, negative. So the trick was uh, to read the APSR, which is the Application Program Status Register, which is a synonym for the CPSR. Um, so these are changes that happen post like ARM v5. So, so if you if you look in the example in the folder example six, you'll actually see some assembly inline assembly to read these uh, CPSR values, um, and I just found it useful. So the next one is uh, how do we do uh, reversing byte order? Uh, so sometimes. We're all in little Indian mode. We store data um, in uh, different Indian mode. And uh, we don't want to use ARM's hardware features to access that memory. Well, this is how you do it. So uh, ARM does all these hardware level optimizations for memory access. But uh, it's better just to stick with one convention, which is little Indian. And then if we want to do our own little big Indian operation, you can do it in code. Um, using REV, which reverses the byte order and endianness of the value in the register. Uh, reverse uh, 16 just does uh, half word at a time, uh, reversing the byte order. And then uh, finally, uh, I believe reverse SH, uh, it does it for only the lower 16 bits. And it also updates. Uh, it does a sign extension, which means if you have a negative value, uh, it treats the lower half word as a two's complement integer and uh, extends the sign when it does the operation. So here's an example. So if you have uh, reverse R0, R0, and R0 is filled with A, B, C, D, uh, D, E, F, F, then it does it as F, F, D, E, C, D, A, B. So it takes, uh, goes basically in reverse byte order and uh, puts that into R0. Similarly, reverse 16, uh, it'll keep the, uh, it'll just take A, B, C, D and reverse those, and then it'll take F, F, D, E and reverse those. So this is reverse 16. So if you were to use uh, reverse SH, it just takes these and flips these two on them. Does that make sense? So I just wanted to put this in again. Um, this is the illustrious uh, current program status register. Uh, with your flags. Um, so the reason I put it in is for these logical operations, which come next. So this is just for your reference. Again, I just put it in there uh, every time. So people don't have to, or they can look it up at the board. Also, I've written them there. So. So now we get to logical operations. So uh, you have the AND, which does a bitwise AND of the two operands, stores it into the destination register. Bitwise clear, you provide it a mask. And wherever there's a bit uh, that's set to 1, it clears that bit to 0. Um, exclusive OR does the exclusive OR of two operands, stores it into the destination register. Uh, ORR is the instruction for bitwise or. And similarly, uh, bitwise or not, which takes the one's complement of one, uh, the second register and then bitwise ors it with the first one and stores the result into the destination register. Um, compare is, it's, uh, is interesting because so all these uh, logical operations actually end up updating your flags. So that's how they uh, figure out whether a uh, logical operation was true or false, um, is they do it using the flags. So compare, uh, for example, takes the two operands, and you're trying to compare if it's uh, greater than or equals and things like that. Um, it'll actually subtract the two values and then update the appropriate flags. Uh, and that's how it does the comparison. So similarly for compare negative, which is a misnomer, uh, there is no real negative. It's just adding the two um, two values in the registers and then um, setting the flags. Now, these two instructions, there is no destination register. So it's just going to 
uh, either add the two values and then update the flags. Um, and there's going to be no update to a destination register. So you only have two operands for this, these instructions. Uh, TEQ is uh, similar to exclusive or. Um, and so doing an add and a subtract, now you can do an exclusive or with two uh, register values and it updates the flags for equality uh, using an exclusive or. And finally, the test does an AND. And, uh, and we'll look at conditional execution a little bit later. Uh, that's where these will be useful. So you can actually do a branch based on uh, the logical operation preceding it. So here's an example of AND. Uh, and you'll almost always see an AND with an S for updating the flags. Uh, and it only takes two operands. Same thing with uh, a bitwise OR. And so here you can actually um, see it's only, uh, you're, it's always using an S suffix with the instruction. Uh, this one's interesting because here the compare instruction that was generated. Um, so here I have an if condition where I'm taking a uh, exclusive or of two variables and then checking if the result is greater than zero. So that actually translates into the exclusive or instruction above uh, where it takes the two variables, doesn't it? does an exclusive OR, and then it does a comparison to zero. And uh, if it's less than or equal, this is sort of the conditional execution that I was telling you guys about. Um, and based on the earlier logical operations, it's able to decide whether to branch to uh, back to main or back to, uh, or whether to go to the add function or subtract function. So, so these are actually offsets. Uh, from main to add and subtract. So bitwise clear. So here, again, as I had mentioned earlier, it takes the bits that have been set to one and clears them. Um, so it's, what it's doing essentially is it's taking the ones complement of the one operand and then ending it with the second operand register and storing the result into destination. So the mask can be a shifted value as well. So here I'm just using a simple example for a bit clear R2, R0, R1. But you can also provide a logical shift operation on top of this uh, last operand. And you'll, uh, you can do uh, some more complex uh, things. And this is especially useful because a lot of uh, ARM uses memory mapped I.O. And you want to be able to set interrupt bits or disable interrupts and things like that. So bit clear comes in very handy for this. So now we'll talk about um, memory operations. So so far, most of the instructions we've covered uh, don't generally touch the memory uh, as much. So the load and store operations are what allow you to get data from memory into the registers and then uh, store them back. So uh, one of the caveats that I found from the manual was that the load store can only load and store data on the boundary alignment that is the uh, same as the data type being used in the program. Um, so uh, load can only, an example of this is load can only uh, load 32-bit values on a memory address that's four byte aligned. So, but you can also do things like uh, half word aligned memory accesses. So, um, and if you want to deal with 64 bits, uh, you actually have to translate that into two 32 bit uh, moves. So, an example here is uh, so when you say LDR R0 R1 in brackets, so what your the bracket stands for, you can think of as memory contents of. So, you're taking the memory contents of the address that's stored in R1 and putting that value into R0. Okay. Similarly, uh, store goes in the reverse direction. Now you'll notice, uh, if you remember, I had mentioned that the destination register comes first. 
But in this case, the destination is really memory. So when you say store R0, R1 in brackets, it's what it's doing is taking the value in register R0 and storing it at the address uh, that's stored in R1. So it's going the opposite direction. Uh, LDO, and you can have uh, interesting uh, um, variations on the same instruction by doing um, immediate uh, value additions. You can also do shifts uh, using the inline barrel shifter on the same instruction. So for example, LDR R0 with R1 comma 4 means that take the value or the memory contents of R, the address in R1, add four bytes to it, take the value at that address and store that into R0. And similarly, store does, uh, does the exact same thing but in reverse. So it takes the value in R0 and stores it into uh, the value uh, into the address uh, at R1 plus 4. So, so this uh, square bracket notation is actually called pre-indexed addressing mode. So there are different addressing modes that we'll look at later where if you want to update the value in R1 here, for example, uh, you can do that. So and so just accessing that memory location and then leaving the address in R1 alone, you can actually update it. So it's like it becomes like a plus equals sort of. Um, and we'll look at that later too. So here's an example. So here we, uh, I actually used a pointer, an integer pointer, to, um, to actually get it to uh, store, generate the store uh, and load instructions. So um, here I'm adding two to the pointer value uh, after assigning it the address of a local variable. Um, and here, what you actually see, we'll talk a little bit more about frames in the uh, ARM, but it's taking the stack pointer, which is always stored in R7. It acts as your base pointer or your frame pointer, generally, in thumb mode. And it's taking the values off the stack, which is where your um, local variables are being stored, plus 4 and plus 12, and then uh, actually uh, storing and loading from that memory address. So, as I mentioned earlier, uh, R7 is the known as the base address register, and the base address register is different from the base pointer that I mentioned. So the base address register is, we'll refer to that terminology when we do load store multiples, um, but it's the register that contains the base address of where you want to perform that memory operation, like the load or the store. And the base address register can be anywhere from R0 to R12, the stack pointer, or the link register. So you can do load stores on stack pointer, you can do load stores on R0 through R12, uh, you can even do it on the link register, which is your saved program count. Um, and so we'll cover that in more detail. So now we get to control flow operations. So, so far we've covered um, arithmetic operations, data moving operations, uh, logical operations, uh, memory operations. So, how do we get it to do uh, interesting things by using branching? So, a branch is exactly that. It takes the value of your uh, subroutine uh, address and puts that into the PC. So if you write to the PC or the program counter, it actually uh, turns into a branch and it actually jumps to that address. Now, I mentioned to you the two different modes in ARM, which is the thumb and the ARM mode. So you actually have limits on, you know, uh, because of the encoding, you know, the instruction, you have limits on how far you can jump with branch. So with a branch, you have a range of plus or minus 16 megabytes from where your program counter currently is uh, in thumb mode. And in R mode, you have 32 megabytes. And that makes sense because you have uh, a 32 bits for your encoding versus 16 bits uh, for the same instruction. Um, similarly, uh, branch with link uh, BLX is an interesting instruction because it actually saves the 
program counter into the link register before jumping to the target address. So it does this for you. Um, so that's the BLX. So, uh, and BX will do the same thing. So the X is essentially specifying, um, you know, store the program counter into the link register and then jump to the new program counter value. And similarly, um, you have a compare and branch. So this allows you to do a comparison operation and a branch in one instruction. Uh, earlier, you saw examples where you would do the conditional branch, but you had to do a logical operation beforehand, and then do a comparison or an exclusive or, and then do a jump separately in a separate branch instruction. This is more for code size um, um, optimization, I guess, uh, that they've included this. Uh, but as you can see, the range is also very limited uh, with a compare on branch to zero, where you can only jump uh, either plus four or plus 130, because the PC is always pointing um, two instructions ahead. Uh, in thumb mode, you're going to be able to do uh, plus four, you know, jump to the four instructions ahead, or, or uh, yes, and or you can go up to 130 bytes ahead in the address space. And uh, you also have a table branch where uh, you, ha you can have an offset-like table, and you can tell it to uh, use the value in that table for the branch. Um, so TBB does just that. And uh, so you're limited sort of on the size here again to uh, 510 bytes of, for the op offset. Uh, so. Uh, this is what you can store in your offset table, not the offset table size itself. Um, similarly, TBH is with half word offsets, so where you just want to manipulate the uh, lower half word, uh, you can jump from 0 to about uh, 131 megs. So we would seen an example of this before. Uh, I thought I'd go into a little bit more detail on how these conditional branches work. So earlier we had seen a branch if less than or equal. So that's what BLE stands for. Uh, all it's doing is, based on the logical operations that have occurred before this, it's updated the negative uh, zero or uh, overflow flags. And it uses those three flags to say, uh, check whether it was less than or equal or not. So uh, here in this case, if it's equal, uh, generally, the compare operation does a subtraction, so it will set the zero flag if the subtraction, if the two values were equal and it subtracted them, the zero flag gets set, so it, it knows, hey, it's an equals uh, condition. And the overflow and negative flags are compared if it's uh, um, less than or greater than, essentially. So those are the two differences. So that's how it's able to tell whether it's uh, doing uh, whether it's a branch of less than or branch of greater than. And if equal, again, it just uses the zero flag. And not equals also uses the zero flag. It only branches if the Z flag is set to zero. Um, so as I explained, um, it's using the negative and the overflow flags to check if the values are greater or less than. So here's an example. Uh, this is an example in your uh, examples folder. So I'm actually uh, trying to do a loop, I believe. So um, it's actually comparing uh, two values and then branching if the comparison is not equal. So I'm um, actually a for loop, if you think about it. It just has a i is less than or i is equal to something, you know, keep looping. So that's what this is doing. Here it's actually jumping to a libc function um, if, if the two values are not equal. So, And you can see uh, this is another example of how arithmetic shifts or logical shifts are being used in line with a move. This is again for your reference. So uh, having covered all these uh, arithmetic operations, logical um, memory operations, and uh, sort of the conditional um, branching operations or control flow operations, we can actually look at 
hello world. And this is actually on your VM. So if you guys go to the hello world folder in your projects directory, Instructions beginning with a dot are actually uh, assembler directives, which tell the assembler um, you know, sort of how to arrange these objects and uh, sort of to identify the different pieces in the code. So in here, we have a uh, global start, which is similar to your main method. Um, and so this is how the operating system knows where to start executing your program. Um, the way you actually do uh, system calls in assembly is you use uh, the syscall uh, number is actually loaded into R7. And then uh, you do a SPY instruction. So this is one of the first uh, instructions that you'll see for changing mode. So SPY actually stands for software and interrupt. And all it does is it changes your processor from uh, user mode, which is what we've been talking about so far, where all your programs run, into supervisor mode. So normally the Linux kernel will be run in supervisor mode, and it has uh, uh, privileged accesses to memory and things like that uh, as compared to user mode. Um, and it can do a lot more things in uh, supervisor mode. So the way to switch to supervisor mode is actually to use the SWI instruction or recently, they've been deprecating SWI and coming out with something called the supervisor call, which is SVC instruction. So you can use either SVC or SWI. Um, and you just, uh, the way you pass the argument to the system call to specify which system call it is, is use R7. Uh, so in this case, you can see uh, I'm setting R7 to 4 uh, for syswrite system call. And uh, I'm setting the file descriptor to 1, which is, stands for STD out. Uh, the message, actually, you can specify using a ASCII Z uh, directive for the assembler, which says, this is just a string. Uh, place it somewhere in read-only memory. And uh, whenever you say message colon here, I uh, can't really see that. But it's actually message. So, so whenever you reference message, it refers to the address uh, of this string, essentially. And so you're loading the file descriptor as the first argument to your syswrite call, followed by your string's address. Finally, uh, you pass it the length of the string. So in this case, it's 14 characters, including the new line. And then uh, you move the syswrite number, which is 4. Uh, there's actually online, you can find plenty of references for syscall um, numbers. And then you just uh, <coughs> call SWI, and it makes the system call. It switches to supervisor mode. Kernel takes over, uh, sees that it's uh, trying to run a syswrite system call, runs the system call, and then comes back. And then all I do is a similar thing, but for sys exit to exit the code. So do you guys actually run make? It'll generate the uh, hello, hello world uh, 
executable, and then you type slash hello, and it prints hello world to the screen. So. And if you look at the make file, so here you can see I'm not using GCC as the uh, compiler for the assembly code. I'm using the GNU assembler, uh, which is called by using AS. And then I have a, a separate linker, which is actually, I believe it's called Gold, uh, GNU, uh, GNU linker. So that's LD. And uh, so it takes the assembly file, uh, generates the objects, and then generates the, uh, and then links it for running in memory and generates the executable in L format, ELF. So one of the interesting things about the SWI syscall is the encoding that's generated from the SWI instruction. Um, it actually only uses uh, the 8 bits for the encoding, I believe. So you have 24 bits that are still available that you can actually use. Um, and we'll look into that a little bit later. Um, so you can differentiate between different SWI system calls. And uh, for some reason, the Linux kernel that's running here doesn't use those 24 bits. So you can see it says SWI 0. So it actually appends that value to the encoding. Um, and so here, Linux just ignores it. But you could actually use it to differentiate between different system calls. So when you say SWI 1, it could mean uh, or SWI4, it could mean uh, syswrite versus a um, SWI1, uh, which would mean system exit. So uh, I don't know why they didn't do that, but that's just the way uh, Linaro chose to implement it. So. so the instructions we've covered so far are uh, up there. So we have we went sort of through the arithmetic operations. Uh, logical operations, memory, data operations. Uh, finally, we went through control flow, uh, how the branches work. Uh, and finally, we covered the SWI uh, uh, as used for a system call. So all the SWI is doing is it's changing the mode and running the interrupt handler uh, for the software interrupt. Uh, and the Linux kernel is using that for its system call uh, convention. So now we get to uh, an exciting and fun lab called, uh, it's the Fibonacci sequence number generator. So the idea is uh, you're going to write in assembly, I've given you some filler code to start off with, uh, and sort of the, uh, the algorithm to how, to how to do this, but this will hopefully um, help you uh, in writing the assembly code for this. Um, so you have it's basically exactly what a Fibonacci sequence is. So for the interesting value to look for will be 6. Because when you enter a 6, you should get an 8. The rest of them are pretty much the same. So, so x is sort of your index variable. And actually, there were two sample algorithms that I found uh, uh, for this. So there's one that does it recursively and one that doesn't. And uh, for the assembly one, I figured it would be shorter to use the recursive algorithm. So the assembly filler code that you're seeing is actually using um, this algorithm here. So if you have a different one that you'd like to implement, please let me know. So the file that you'll be modifying is fit.s, uh, which is the assembly file. The fit.c is just a shell for calling the function as a main, it just calls Fibonacci. And one of the things that uh, I haven't mentioned yet is that the way you do return values in subroutines is to uh, put the value into R0. So R0 becomes your uh, return value for a function. All right, so, so this is actually a possible solution. This is not the solution. Um, so, just like the recursive algorithm that was shown earlier, um, 
first thing to do is we compare to see if the uh, value is less than or equal to zero. So x gets passed into us uh, in register R0. So we'll see this a little bit more in detail later, but ARM's calling convention for um, calling methods uh, is to pass the arguments to a method in the registers R0, 1, 2, and 3. Um, it doesn't use the stack like uh, you've seen in x86. Um, so there's a certain calling convention when you call uh, methods in ARM. So what it's doing here first is it's saving the R3, R4, R5, and the link register onto the stack so that it can uh, mess with the values, right? And before it uh, exits out of the function, it actually restores it using a pop. So this was sort of the first uh, instructions that we covered was the push and the pop. So it's just pushing all these register values and saving them so it can use R3, R4 for other operations, and then popping them off the stack uh, at, when, before it returns. And if you look, the, the way it returns is actually to pop the value into the program counter. Uh, thereby causing a branch back to the calling function. In this case, it was main. Um, so the first thing uh, the recursive algorithm showed was to do a comparison of the index with uh, zero, see if it's less than or equal, and to return zero if it is, and otherwise return a one if it's equal to one. So that's exactly what we do here. Um, so here, it's actually using something called labels. Um, this should have been provided for you. So uh, when you say a dot L3, it actually uh, refers to the instruction uh, address down here. Uh, so it's just a sort of labeling in assembly. Um, I'm sure you've seen this before. So, um, so first thing it's doing here, um, interestingly, I did what uh, Benjamin had suggested uh, from the remote site, which was to write the code in C, uh, generate the assembly, uh, cheat a little bit, uh, just to see what would be produced. Um, so as you can see, instead of doing a comparison operation, it's doing a direct subtraction, which is what a compare actually is. But uh, it's updating the flags in the process right, using a sub s. Um, so it's comparing the index being passed in to the value zero, and if it's uh, if it's uh, less than or equal, then it jumps to L3, where it actually sets the return value, which is also passed using R0 to zero, and then it's returning by restoring the stack and the program counter. So when it entered the method, it saved the link register onto the stack, which is where the calling method is coming from. Uh, that the main's address is stored in the link register, so it saves that on the stack, and when it returns, it restores that link register back into the PC, and the program counter now start, points back to main, and it's back where it uh, called Fibonacci. Does that make sense? So we'll get more in detail into uh, calling convention a little bit later. Uh, so once it's uh, compared to zero, and then it's compared to e see, see if it's equal to one, uh, it goes to either of these two where it returns a zero or a one. Okay. So this is sort of exactly what we saw with the, uh, the, these two C statements right here. So this uh, jumps to a .l3 label, this jumps to .l4 label, right, and returns zero or one accordingly. So that's what these two are. And finally, uh, the recursive uh, portion of this, which is interesting, uh, is it actually adds a really large value, which is FFFFFF, which in two's complement notation is a minus one. So to, in order to subtract one, uh, it chose to add this really large value uh, constant to R4. Uh, and if you see here, R4 actually has the value of R0 stored in it. So the index value x is being stored in R4 like a variable, and that's being used here to subtract 1 um, and then return, do a recursive return. And similarly, uh, uh, when it wants to subtract 2, uh, 
So it's being, it's passing the index value here to Fibonacci. So um, R0 becomes the first argument to Fibonacci here as well as here. So all it's doing is it's taking the local variable for F, uh, which is a copy of X, uh, subtracting one, calling Fibonacci, uh, and then subtracting two, calling Fibonacci again. Now, uh, finally, after the recursive call is made, it actually does uh, add the two values. <coughs> so here, uh, from this branch, you'll get a value in R0, and from this one, uh, you'll get a value in R5, it adds the two, stores that in R0, and then returns the value. Does that make sense? So this is where it's adding the return values from uh, the two Fibonacci recursive calls. So the interesting thing to note here is that uh, you get the return value in R0 here, uh, and it saves that value into R5 before it makes this next recursive call. Right. So, so hopefully everyone was able to get this. <laughs>